We all ask questions. Are eyebrows considered facial hair? I've always wondered, do vegetarians eat animal crackers? If a number two pencil's so popular, why is it still number two? Do bald people get dandruff? Why are power outages reported on TV? That makes no sense. But some questions are more meaningful than others. How do I handle all the stress in my life? How do I discover God's will for my life and live it out every day? I have a hard time dealing with disappointment. What does the Bible say I should do? How can I be the parent my kids need me to be and the one God wants me to be? What does the Bible say about dealing with difficult people? Because I know some. Are we actually living in the end times? What does that mean for me? So we turn to the one who has all the answers. We'll examine some of our biggest questions and discover God's best plan. Why? Because you asked for it. All right, we're in a series called You Asked For It, and we probably will do this next year as well. What we do is we, on Easter Sunday, we handed out surveys to over 700 people. We had a tremendous response of people um, that filled out the surveys. And part of the questions we asked people was, what are some things you'd like to hear about? And, and, and we had a number of people choose different topics. And just to let you know what we've been doing and the order of which the most important ones for you were. The very first week we dealt with, how do I deal with stress? That was week number one. We talked about that. Uh, week number two, we talked about, uh, boy, my memory is fading here this morning. Uh, <laughs> week number two, oh, we talked about my purpose, thank you so much. I forgot my purpose. The week number two was my purpose. Thank you so much. Whoever said that, God bless you. I was, I was going to put it in my notes today. I said, I can remember. So <laughs> my purpose. The third one was, how do I really change? How do I really change? And, and, and many of us, and we want to change, we desire to change, but we struggle changing. And so you can go to cornerstonecheshire.com and you can look it up and you can listen to those messages. I encourage you to do such because I think they're very important messages and they're very timely. And today is, uh, I think, one of the most important messages that you and I need to apply on a daily basis than perhaps any other thing next to breathing, eating, and giving your life to Jesus Christ would be to learn how to forgive. And today is simply this. How do I really forgive? How do I really forgive? And this is the, this is the most important thing next to knowing Jesus Christ in eating and breathing and sleeping, I would say, is to know how to forgive. And my friends, you're going to have so many opportunities to practice this once you learn the importance of it. And what's very interesting is the Bible has said for millennia about forgiving those that have offended you. And now medical science and psychiatrists and psychologists and behavior sciences scientists are telling us, yes, that's true, that if you don't forgive somebody, it can affect your health. They've actually done studies, study after study. I just go on the internet. Don't do it right now. But go home later on if you want to and do, look at the studies they've done about unforgiveness and what it does to somebody. Nelson Mandela said the following, which is a tremendous and very true quote. He said the following. He said, not to forgive somebody is like drinking poison and helping someone else get sick. Not forgiving somebody is like drinking poison and helping someone else get sick. And that is absolutely true. That we are not, I would propose to you today, I've said it many times, that you and I are not designed emotionally to carry the emotion of unforgiveness. When God created us without sin, there was no need not to forgive somebody. But when sin came, came the need to forgive somebody. And you and I are not designed to carry that emotion. That emotion of unforgiveness what is toxic. It will destroy your health. It will destroy your relationship. It will destroy your relationship with God and, and, and hinder it to such a degree that it's very, very, very serious. And so it's one of the most important things that you and I can learn to do is to forgive others and to be forgiven ourselves. If we don't get a hold of this practice, it will really limit the scope of what can happen in your life, can open you up to all kinds of problems. It's money studies. I want to share with you a really important study I just read about. Never heard this before. Fascinating. I was reading an article uh, a couple weeks ago, and I took it. It says, it's called The Science of Us, was the article, listed what they call the 17 things we know about forgiveness. It's a fascinating article. And perhaps the most interesting scientific study on forgiveness noted of what dogs and cats do. 
And they did studies, and they found out that all the different animals out there, the domestic animals, the ones that have an ability to, to kind of, you know, they have an ability to act. You know what they found out? There's one species of pet at home that does not forgive. Guess what it is? A cat. They say there's no indication that cats forgive. When I got married to Sandra, I had a cat. I'm not going to tell you what the cat did. But the cat is no longer here. It's at your local deli. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I, I, that's not funny. That's not funny. Okay. <laughs> that's about all the laughter we're going to have today. This is a serious topic. But, ser I mean, isn't it interesting? They actually did a study on that. That's, it's crazy. But the, cats don't forgive. I, we all know that. Yeah, we all know that. So, you know, cats are demonic. That's why witches have. Okay, let's, let's just stop where we're ahead. <laughs> if you love cats, I'm sorry. It's a wonderful Broadway play. All right, let's go on. <laughs> well, today we're going to look about forgiveness and how to forgive other people. Because I think, I think a lot of us understand the importance of forgiveness. But I think the reason we don't forgive is we have the wrong understanding of what forgiveness is and what forgiveness is not. And I, I just want to start and, and, and say a few things about forgiveness about that. But before we do that, I want to read a couple of scriptures to you. And I'm just going to look at uh, Colossians 3:12 through 13. This is uh, the Bible tells us what we should do with forgiveness. What it says, it says this: Since God chose you to be a holy people, He loves you. You must clothe yourself with tender-hearted mercy. You know what the Bible says? Clothe yourself. It's actually a decision you make. You're not born with clothes on. In case you haven't noticed, you actually have to dress yourself before to cover yourself. And it's the same thing with forgiveness. It's a choice of something we can put on and something we can take off. So with tender heart and mercy, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience, make allowance for each other's faults. Some of us make no allowances for each other's faults, which we're going to share with what we believe part of the reason is. And forgive anyone who oh offends you. If you are alive, you're going to be offended. If I, I always say this, and people get upset when I say it, but I'll say it anyhow. If I have not offended you yet, please give me an opportunity. I promise you I will. Why? Because I'm a human being. I'm going to say something you may not like. I might walk past you without saying hello. I might not invite you to 201 to have, um, or 101. I, I, you know, I'll make mistakes, and I guarantee you, and you'll do things, by the way, will offend me as well. But you know, I've made a decision ahead of time. I've made a decision that I will not be offended. I'll try my very best not to be offended because offense does not do very well. It causes all kinds of trouble. But forgive anyone who offends you. Remember, the Lord forgave you, so you must forgive others. And, and, and by the way, the grammar in that sentence in the original language, which is the Greek language which it's written in, it says you must forgive. It's not like an option when you get up to it. No, it says you must forgive. And what's so amazing is this. God asks us to do things not because he wants to limit our freedom, because he ultimately wants to give us more freedom. The Bible says from the very, very beginning to the law of Moses, these are for your benefit that it may go well with you. You and I were not designed to hold resentment and unforgiveness. It does damage to you. It does you absolutely, positively, no good whatsoever to have unforgiveness. To not forgive somebody hurts you more than it hurts the other person. It's toxic, it will destroy your health, and we're going to show you it opens the door for the enemy, yes, there is an enemy out there, to have a field day with you in your spirit and in your life. So we need to understand a couple of things. I want to bring something really important to your attention. In order to understand this, we need to understand something about forgiveness. First of all is this. Forgiveness, unforget, I'm sorry, forgiveness is not a feeling. Let me say it again. Forgiveness is not a feeling. Resentment is a feeling. Unforgiveness is a feeling. But forgiveness is more of an attitude that you and I choose to do. It's a conscious choice we make that leads in the direction of forgiveness in action. 
I will guarantee you, most of the time, if not all the time, when you know you should forgive, it's the last thing you want to do. Now, I understand here this morning that uh, we all have different things that have happened to us. And maybe some of you, and, and maybe some of you watching later on or live right now, you've been through some things that have been horrific, very painful. Unfortunately, uh, I've been uh, doing, uh, I've been in the ministry, or, or full-time ministry since 1996, and a lot has happened since then. And I've dealt with a lot of different things through the years, unfortunately, and one of the most heinous and the most difficult is abuse of children. And I've dealt, unfortunately, a number of people, this is extraordinary, one out of four women are, are abused sexually before they're 18 in the United States of America. These are statistics. And we've had people that we've spoken to through the years, multiple people that have been abused physically and their innocence has been robbed from them, from people they loved and trusted. It's been horrible to hear these stories. And something rises up in me as a father that just, you know, I want to make it, I want to go out there and get a posse together and take care of it. I mean, that's, that's something that rises up and there's, there's got to be justice. And, and so people live with this. And, and maybe you've been through a horrible divorce where your spouse just totally ripped you to shreds, took all the money, put the kids against you, whatever happened. And, and, and it's destroyed you, and you're still licking your wounds, not quite healed. Maybe there was a pastor or a spiritual leader that you trusted, that you invested in, and they betrayed you. Or perhaps even worse than that, maybe you betrayed yourself. Maybe you did something so terrible, maybe you were part of an abortion, maybe you had an abortion, and you made the choice, and every time someone brings it up, something churns inside of you, and you say, I can never forgive myself. I don't know where you are. It's not really about me. It's about what God says about forgiveness. And I want to tell you right now, this morning, I'm going to remind everybody, I hope you get this today. If you get nothing else, forgiveness does, unforgiveness does not work for your psyche, your spiritual life, your physical life, your relational life. It simply does not work work. It will throw you out of balance. It will damage you physically, emotionally, spiritually, relationally. It is a toxin that must be dealt with lest it destroys your health on every level imaginable in the mind. It just does not work. You are not designed to hold on forgiveness. It doesn't work. It destroys. Let me tell you, it destroys it's one of the hardest things that we have to do, and it gives us the most liberation you can imagine. And Jesus has a lot to say about it. But I want to mention something to you first of all is this, about forgiveness. What's going to go ahead? I'm going to go a little bit out of order, guys, than I give you. After all, we're a spirit-filled church, and so we go as the Spirit leads so I can change and have a good excuse. All right. So in Matthew chapter 6, Jesus spends a great deal of time talking about something. His disciples asked him, hey, Jesus, how do we pray? And he gave him a wonderful model of prayer. It's called, we call it the Lord's Prayer, which really the disciples' prayer. And what he does in this wonderful prayer found in Matthew chapter 6, he actually gives you bullet points. And these bullet points are an order of importance that give us a great order how to pray. And he goes on, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven, right? Then it says, give us this day our daily bread. Now, very interesting, when he says daily bread, what he's alluding to is what happened with the Israelites in the desert. Every day they had to get their daily bread. They had to go out and collect something called manna, which was like their bread, and they had to collect it daily. They could not store it overnight except for on Friday night and the Sabbath. Otherwise, every single day, they had to collect the manna every single day. It was their sustenance for that day. They could not take that tomorrow's uh, today. Okay. Now, very interesting it says that. Give us this day our daily bread. Right connected to that, give us this day our daily, it says, then what next? And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. I didn't know what a trespass was. I thought it was a password in an amusement park as a kid. No, trespass, or Lord, basically it says this, Lord, forgive me like I forgive others. Now, why did Jesus tie that to daily bread? 
Why? There's a reason why things are done in the Bible. Yeah, I'll tell you the reason why. Because forgiveness is a daily necessity as eating and drinking and sleeping. Let me say that again. Forgiveness and exercising forgiveness is, is a daily exercise akin to eating, drinking, and sleeping. It is absolutely an essential part of your health and my health. And you and I better learn how to forgive if you want to have a healthy life. Otherwise, devastation will follow you like a bond collector. I'm telling you. I'm absolutely telling you. I am convinced. I never saw that before. I've read, this, I've read the Lord's Prayer so many times. I've prayed it so many times. This past week, for the first time, I got a new revelation. Not new revelation, but I got a more of a, um, a, a, a bigger girth, if you will, a bigger, bigger view of the Lord's Prayer that I felt the Lord said, well, as I was reading this, there's a reason why it's connected to daily bread, because you need to forgive daily. Sleeping, eating, drinking, and forgiving is absolutely a part of your diet that you and I need to exercise for real spiritual and physical, emotional, and relational health. I'm telling you, that is the truth, and even medical science has finally caught up with the Bible and agrees with me about that. Actually, it agrees with the Bible. So this is all part of it, and Jesus, now I, I want to show you a little bit more about this and, and the warning that the God gives us through the Bible. Okay, he, he gives us the Lord's Prayer in Matthew 6, uh, and, and he says what? He says what? He says, give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us as we forgive our debtors. Now look at the very next part of the Lord's Prayer. What does it say? And deliver us from what? Deliver us from evil. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. If you don't forgive, guess what happens? Your deliverance from evil is marred and compromised. As a result... Things that normally you'll be able to overcome, you will not be able to overcome because God is not fighting your battle because you refuse to forgive. Oh, come on, how can you say that? That's legalism. No, my friend, it's the way it is. How can you say that? Well, let me show you how I can say that. We go back right after this. And what does he say in verse 14? Just in case you and I missed it. He says this. For, verse 14, if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. I wish the Bible stopped there, because that would be enough. Okay, if I forgive others, God will forgive me. But he doesn't stop there. Just to clarify it, what does he say at next is one of the most, I call sobering and humbling verses, I believe, in the Bible. What does he say here? But if you do not forgive men of their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Now, what on earth is Jesus saying? What about once saved, always saved? Are you saying, I'm going to hell? Listen, I, am not saying, I don't have the power or the ability to say who's going or who's not going to go. At best, at best, the ramifications of that verse means your relationship will be thwarted to such a degree that God will not be involved with your life. At best. At worst, he doesn't forgive you. If he doesn't forgive you, what's the consequences? Listen, we want to sit there. You want to argue about this? I think it's a waste of time. Why would you even want to put God to the test with such a thing? It's, to me, it's a mindless exercise. The truth of the matter is you're not designed not to forgive. And God tells you to forgive. It's a daily experience that will, will protect you um, oh, I mean, come on, folks. Isn't it, um, isn't it absolutely amazing? The Bible says something, and people are like, no, it ain't true, it ain't true, it ain't true. Oh, my goodness, science tells us it's true. Science, by the way, is a study of what God has made. And sometimes they get it wrong, and they get it right later on. Undeni undeniable, this is a part of it. So, Jesus, now just to help us to understand what we're talking about here, I want to help bring more clarity to this. Uh, if you look at Matthew uh, chapter 18... Uh, just to help bring more clarity to this, okay? Because I'm not just pulling an obscure passage of Scripture and pulling one little verse out of context. And by the way, be very, very careful when you hear of a teacher, he or she on television or on Internet, wherever you go, make sure you look at the context in which it's said. 
And make sure it's not a verse all by itself in the Bible. So Jesus says it across many different things and across the Bible. The Bible talks about forgiveness. And one of the ways it talks about this, Jesus gives a parable. And I'm going to, for the sake of time, I'm going to go a little quicker than I, I'm not going to read the whole passage of Scripture. But let me tell you what happened. There was a man that worked a, worked a menial job, didn't make a lot of money. He was thrown in prison, and he owed the king millions of dollars in today's, in today's market. And the man said, oh, Lord, please forgive. Actually, you know what? I'll just read it because the Bible does a better job. I'm going to go ahead and read it. Because by the time I explain it, I can just read it and be over with. So we'll go ahead and do that. <laughs> Verse 32. The king called the man... He had forgiven. Oh, yeah, I, let me just say what happened. So he forgave the man of all his debt. His kids were in prison and all that. And he says, please, please, please forgive me. Please forgive me. I tell you, I'll pay back every last cent. And the king's like, yeah, you can't pay me back. There's no way you can pay the money back. But you know what? I'm going to let you go. So the man, whew, he gets out of there. He finds another guy that owes him like a week's wages, maybe 500 bucks. You know what he does? He grabs him by the neck and chokes him. you got to give that back to me right now. And what happens when the king found out? Well, let's look what the king said. Verse 32, this is a parable that Jesus gives. A parable to teach a spiritual significance and a spiritual truth. The, then the king called the man he had forgiven and said, you evil servant. That's not very positive. Now I know, Jesus doesn't mince words. I forgave you that tremendous debt because you pleaded with me, not because you had anything right. You pleaded with me. Shouldn't you have mercy on your fellow servant just as I had mercy on you? The angry king sent the man to prison to be tortured until he had paid his entire debt. How is that man going to pay his entire debt? He's in prison. Now, I wish he would stop there, but he doesn't. Then Jesus breaks it down for us today. This is what he says in verse 35. Very sobering and very important scripture. That's what my heavenly Father will do to you if you refuse to forgive your brother just by saying it? No. Your brothers and sisters from your heart. Well, who on earth can do that? Nobody. Nobody. You need God to forgive. What are the ramifications of this? Hand him over to the torturers? Mental illness? Arthritis? Emotional? I'm not saying anyone has an emotional problem hasn't forgiven. I'm not suggesting that for him. Please don't take me out of context. But what I am saying, it contributes and can contribute to these type of things. High blood pressure. In fact, I did a study. This is very interesting. Crazy study. I just read a study this past week. A, a university did a study... And what they did is they had people jump. Kind of bizarre. I don't know why they had to study. Uh, um, Emerson University. So they had these people jump. And so while they jumped, they measured the same people. And they jumped about 18 inches. Some of the people jumped. Then they said, I want you to think of someone that you're angry with that you haven't forgiven. Then they had them jump. They, everybody in the study jumped about two, about two inches less than they did when they thought about something happy. So they're basically saying that unforgiveness puts a weight on you. <laughs> Now, that's a kind of a weird study, but it doesn't it not illustrate what unforgiveness does. It's a heavy burden upon your back. Listen, it, how do I know I haven't forgiven somebody? This is how you know. This is what I found that happened. I'm trying to worship God in church or something. Like, maybe it's happened to you. I'm sitting there, here my heart doesn't at the cross. Oh, this is great. You think of that guy at work. Oh. Right? You know what I'm talking about? You think of that person, your spouse or whatever, your ex or whoever it is, and all of a sudden there's a gut punch in the, oh, and you try to feel God's presence, and you feel there's something blocking it. Yeah, I believe the reason is because that, that emotion of unforgiveness, a choice that you have made willingly, or perhaps unwillingly, now that you know better, you'll know better, to do this. It really shuts out God's presence in your life. We give the, the Bible says, be angry and yet do not sin, lest you give the enemy a foothold. You see, by not forgiving, what you're doing is saying, I'm opening the door, and you know, it's, it's the fall season now. It's getting cold out now, and the, the field mice want to get warm. This is, a little, this is a little warning. doesn't mean you're a bad housekeeper. So you might have field mice come in your house, but if you leave the doors open 
and the garbage there and leave little like insulation and newspaper, they're gonna make a big mess in your house. My friends, if you leave the door open in your life to unforgiveness, it invites the varmints of the demonic realm. Yes, there is a demonic realm. It's not the little pitchfork guy in a red suit running around laughing. We're talking about evil, and evil fallen angels that are out there. I don't believe in that. Well, whether you believe it or not, it will invite the demonic realm. And you're basically saying, God, I do not want your help. That's not a good thing. So the Bible is very clear about that. So how do we deal with it? How do we forgive then? Well, we're gonna, I'm glad you asked the question. <laughs> because we're going to talk about it in a few moments. And I, I wanted to bring your attention to something else. How do we forgive? Well, first of all, you need to understand how important it is. Okay? I, I, let me just go ahead and be, I'm going to jump ahead again a little bit. Let me just tell you what forgiveness is not. Forgiveness does not mean you're saying what the person did was correct. I hope everyone understands that. Just because you forgive somebody does not mean you're saying what they've done is correct. All it's doing is taking the toxin hook out of your mouth like a fish and saying, I refuse to be on that person's line. As long as you want to forgive somebody, you don't forgive somebody, basically you have a hook of that person in your jaw, and they have the real, and it's going to, whether they know it or not, you're going to be constantly trying like a fish, trying to swim in the ocean. You're going to be constantly, you can get so far, oof, and you try to swim, oof. And you can't seem to break certain things in your life because there's a hook of unforgiveness in your mouth. What we have to do is say, I forgive this person. And I'll, I'll share with you how to do it in a little bit. Will you get to it already? I will. <laughs> well, how do we do it? Number one, put yourself with where they are and put them where you are. Huh? Put yourself where they are and put them where you are. What is that supposed to mean? Okay, this means this. Hey, I forgive you. What happens when you do that? If I'm forgiving somebody, I put myself above them. <laughs> I'll forgive you. When you put yourself above somebody as if you're better, it doesn't work very well. Because you have the wrong concept and the wrong idea of who you are. You might think, oh, I'm a pretty good person. I'm gonna show you in a couple seconds here that you're not as good as you think you are. And so instead of looking down at somebody else and say, I forgive you, how about look across and say, you know, I forgive you because you and I are in the same plane together. I am not better than you. We're equal in our offense. Now, how does that work? Well, let's look at a scripture verse called Romans 3.22. And the Bible says the following. It says, we are made right with God. That's Romans 3.22 through 24. I'm reading from the New Living Translation for this particular verse. We're made right with God by placing our faith in Jesus Christ. And this is true for everybody who believes, no matter who we are. I just love the fact that God breaks down all these classes and these different uh, blue state, red state, whatever your state is, whatever your economic situation is, it doesn't make it a whosoever, says. Who believes, no matter who they are, for listen to this, for everyone has sinned. For some of you, that might be a surprise. For everyone, and see, if you can think of somebody, it's probably you. Okay, for everyone has sinned, we all fall short of God's glorious standard, yet God freely and graciously declares that we are righteous, which means that we have no sin in us when he forgives us. He did this through you trying real hard and coming to church and listening to Pastor Eric at Cornerstone Church at 1146 Waterbury Road. Doesn't say that. He did this through Christ Jesus when he freed us from the penalty of our sins. You see, our forgiveness does not come from our good behavior. It does not come because you look good or smell good or sing good or whatever. It comes exclusively by Jesus Christ and what he's done on the cross. The Bible says all have sinned, all have fallen short of the glory of God. There's not one that's righteous. No, not one. It says also in the Old Testament, your righteousness or your way to try to be good is like filthy rags. I'm not going to tell you what filthy rags are. Ten years ago, I would have said it and offended some people, but I've learned better not to say it. Filthy rags compared to his righteousness. And so this is what the Bible says. I love what uh, 
a pastor I, I happen to follow and like him a lot. Uh, he's a good, deep thinker. His name is Timothy Keller. He of uh, Redeemer Presbyterian Church in New York City. Great thinker. And this is a great quote, which I have to quote. It's fantastic. This is what he says about us, about Christians. He says, this is what he says. You are more wicked, you are more wicked than ever dared believe. Let me read that again. You are more wicked than ever dared believe. And yet, you are more loved and accepted in Jesus Christ than you ever dared hope. Let me read that again. You are more wicked than ever dare believe. And yet, you are more loved and accepted in Jesus Christ than you ever dared hope. See, the problem with us is we think we're not that bad. Ah, I'm not that bad. Compared to everyone else, I'm okay. We have the wrong view of ourselves. I'm not that bad. And then we have another view of ourselves. We're like, well, you know, God doesn't really accept me very much. So we had this crazy view. But you know what the real truth is? Truth is, you're more wicked than you ever hoped you would ever be. And you're more loved and forgiven than you ever would think of. So the depravity of you and I and the acceptance of you and I are both extraordinarily high. What's the difference between the, our tremendous depravity and sin and, and disgusting that's in our life and God loving us beyond the scope of our understanding? What's, what brings these two antonyms together? Jesus Christ, through the power of the cross, takes our wickedness and makes it as if we are Jesus ourselves through the cross of Jesus Christ. He is adds to us. That's why it's a cross. It's a plus sign. He adds to us. And so when you understand your depravity, you appreciate it, and you live in his grace and recognize that this person across from you that you have not forgotten is in the same plane. It's called humanity. And you and I have no right to look down on someone like this. What about Hitler? Hitler's in a category all by himself. I'm talking about normal, everyday life. And I will grant and tell you a couple of things about forgiveness and unforgiveness. The people we have the most difficult time forgiving is not people that steal our credit or are mean at work. The people we have the most difficult time forgiving are the people that we love the most. It's that father or mother in who you trusted. That you said they're my parents. It's that aunt or uncle. It's that pastor. It's that best friend. It's the spouse till death do us part. And he or she want to see you die. Oh, the people that we love the most hurt us the most. Do you realize more shootings happen domestically than terror? Is shooting people you love? <laughs> well, gee, yeah, it's true. Look at gun violence in the United States of America. A vast majority of it is people shooting people they know and are supposedly love. Ex-boyfriend, girlfriends, parent, you name it. And so what happens is the depth of our relationship, and so one of the ways we do that is the first thing is you put yourself where they are and put them where you are. Understand that you're like this. See, the Pharisees look at the other way. There's another situation I want to bring to your attention. Jesus was at a Pharisee's house. And these Pharisees, they were religious leaders of their day. They were they're the moral people. They're the ones that would vote the right way, whatever your political persuasion is. They're the ones that held the moral standard. And they were very, very educated, very well. They, they memorized the first five books of Moses. They were extraordinary. They were well-respected. And they were people looked up to them to know how to live their lives. And so there was a man by the name of Simon who invited Jesus to come to his house to have a meal. And what happens is he's sitting there eating, and all of a sudden this woman who's known to be kind of a loose, kind of a, you know, the, woman, the woman of the night, if you will, a woman that's easy, whatever you want to call it, she comes in and she breaks this perfume bottle that's worth about a year's wages, about 55, today's money, about $55,000. And she pours it upon his feet and begins to, to, to cry. And he's laying like this, and, uh, and, and she's doing this. And Simon's like, Pharisee's like, this guy, it ain't no prophet. He, if he knew, and it is what, I'll pick it up now. Verse 39, when the Pharisees who had invited him, this is Luke 7, 39. When the Pharisees 
whom he invited him saw this, they said to himself, this man, if this man were a prophet, <laughs> he would know what kind of woman is touching him. She's a sinner. Boy, it feels good doing that. Then Jesus answered his thoughts. Simon, he said to the Pharisee, I have something to say to you. Go ahead, teacher. Now, isn't that interesting? What hypocrisy. If this guy was a real pastor, he would know better. Oh, hey, teacher, which is like a real term of endearment and respect. So he's lying through his teeth. Go ahead, teacher, Simon replied. And Jesus told him a story. A man loaned money to two people, 500 pieces of silver to one, which is like a year's wages, and one 50 pieces, is like a, maybe a week's wages, and one 50 pieces to the other. But neither of them could repay him. So he kindly forgave them both, canceling their debts. Who do you suppose loved him more than that? Simon answered, well, I suppose the one who canceled the larger debt. That's right, Jesus said. Now, there's something here we need to understand. Uh, the Pharisees thought that their debt was not as bad as this poor woman over here, this filthy woman of the night. We're better than this, this woman. They thought there was less. And what did Jesus say? The reason why she loved much, she was forgiven. And he goes on and says the following. He goes on, verse, verse um, 70, uh, 47, I tell you, her sins, and they are many. He's not saying she didn't have sin. He's not saying, hey, go ahead and do what you want. Jesus will forgive you. Hallelujah. Go ahead and smoke and dope and all that kind of stuff. and uh, snow, Whatever it is. Do what you want to do, and God will forgive you. After a while, we serve a loving God. God's not a judgmental God at all. But what happens here? What does he say? I tell you, her sins, there are many. He says, yeah, she's full of sin. Have been forgiven. Why? So she has shown much love. But the person who is forgiven little only shows little love. Then Jesus said to the woman, your sins are forgiven. The men at the table say among themselves, huh, who's this man that goes around doing that? And Jesus says, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. She received his forgiveness. And he says, her sins, which are many. He says, your sins are which are many, have been forgiven. But he who has little sin loves little. See, the problem is you and I have this idea that our sin is not as bad as the other person. And so I look down on you because, after all, I wouldn't do such a thing. Oh, yeah, we accept these people at our church. Those people. We accept those people at our church. We, we accept them. But we're, after all, we're better than they. We, we never got involved with drugs. We never got involved with sexual morality. We haven't got involved with all the... We, we are better than... Well, yeah, we accept them. That makes God want to vomit. And it should make you want to vomit too. Because you know why? Because all of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. There's not one that is righteous. No, not one. You and I have no ability or right to stand up here with our hands on our hips looking down at somebody saying, I forgive you. No, it should be, I have messed up. Put yourself in someone else's shoes and think that could be me. If not by the grace of God, I would not be forgiven. But what about this? What about that? Listen, I understand that some of you have been really uh, been abused. Maybe you went through a horrible divorce. Your parents were terrible to you. Your boss has been terrible to you. Listen, I'm not suggesting I understand. It's not about me. It's about what the Word of God says. You hold on forgiveness. You think, well, what I'm going to do is I, I'm going to hold. If I, if I don't, if, if I forgive, that, that lets them off the hook. It, well, I'll tell you what else it does. When you don't forgive someone, it shows a fundamental distrust of God. When you don't forgive somebody else, it shows a fundamental distrust of God because you don't think God is going to take care of that person, so I will. And guess what that is? Arrogance. That's not humility. And a lot of us have too much confidence in our ability to ascertain and interpret events. Well, I know what that person... A lot of our, a lot of our arguments and disagreements and hatred is based upon misunderstandings a lot of the times. That's another topic for another time. So as we look at this, we can see 
that unforgiveness is a something that will literally rob you of what God would have to do in your life. And see, the problem is that that Pharisee or that, in that story, the person thought that they were forgiven little, that they didn't have to do much. But the person, when you understand how much God has forgiven you, then you cannot help then forgive somebody else because if not for the grace of God. The apostle Paul says, woe am I, I'm a chief of sinner. He understood that the depth of his sin. Humility is a place to begin. He goes and says that. Now, I love what it says in Isaiah 118. Come now, let's settle this, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, I will make them as white as snow. Though they're red like crimson, I will make them white as wool. If you will only obey me. God longs to cleanse us from our sins. He wants to set you and I free today from unforgiveness. What good does it do to say, I hope they get theirs. They need to learn. You know what? Let it go. What about the person, what about the person that abuses somebody? What about, okay, I need, I need to go here for a moment. We're running out of time, but I need to bring this up. If someone is abusing somebody, it's irresponsible not to say something. So we're not suggesting for a moment that we don't deal with responsibility. If someone is abusing somebody physically, for example, if there's a woman or a man, or let's say a woman's being beat up by her husband, and she said, well, I, I, and her husband goes back, well, you know, the Bible says you must accept, you must forgive. Okay, I guess you're right, I forgive you. And she gets beat up again. And he comes back, says, I'm really sorry, honey, I'm really, really sorry, I won't do it again. He does it again. Unfortunately, I wish, I, said, I wish this was a fictitious story, but it's not. No one, no one recently in recent years are at this church, okay? So I'm not going to break confidential, confidentiality with any of you that just understands that the human condition goes across different churches. So this person refused, and, and she kept, well, well, I have to forgive my, 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 um, my husband. My father said, no, you don't. You forgive him, but he has got a problem. He's going to hurt you or somebody else. You need to leave that guy. And you need to call the police so he'll learn his lesson. But that's not forgiveness. Yet, yet you, you're forgiving him, but you're preventing him from doing it. If there's someone that abuses children, well, you better support that person unless they hurt somebody else. It doesn't mean you accept them back in your life. What it means is you take the hook out of your mouth and I'm not going to be controlled by this hurt anymore. And when you say, Lord, I give it to you, I deal with it, I need to protect other people from this abuse. I don't want anyone else to be abused. But I hand them over to you, God, you deal with it. I hand them over to the authorities. So you, listen, just because you forgive somebody does not mean you accept what they've done is correct. That's a lie. What you're doing, you forgive somebody, you're emotionally detaching yourself of the arsenic poison and you're letting it go. And the thing of the matter is, it is an ongoing process. I'm going to ask the ushers to please hand out the elements. Let me tell you a closing story here. There is a, a televangelist uh, by the name of Jim Baker. You might have heard of the guy. It's not the Secretary Baker that used to be under the Reagan administration. No, Jim Baker was a televangelist, if you've been alive in the 1980s, that was a long time ago. And this gentleman had a TV program called PTL, very successful show. He was married to his a wife named Tammy Faye. They were very successful. They were growing extraordinarily. What happened was, uh, basically, that the word got out that he had an affair with a woman about five years earlier. The word got out. The next thing you know, the government was on him. And he did investigations. He was building these buildings and things like that. Uh, and, and, and claiming he built buildings he didn't build yet. So it really wasn't. And they basically, what happened was, to make a long story short, they tried him of a crime he really didn't commit. And they, after five years of being in prison, they let him go. But they sentenced Jim Baker to prison for 45 years. His wife, Tammy, uh, started becoming friends with his best friend friend and builder, Ro Messinger, who was the builder who built the, 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 all these wonderful buildings at PTL. So guess what happened? She divorced her husband, Jim, while he was in prison, and she married his best friend. Can you imagine that? Talk about betrayal. You lost your wife and your best friend, and in addition to that, she marries him. 
So he says in prison, he had nothing else better to do than to read the Bible and pray. And he said for five years, he would cry out to God, God, I can't believe this. And he cried out, and the, and the, and the, the word of God says, you must forgive Tammy. You must forgive Roe. And, and you know what he did? He said, it, I, it pained me. It pained me. I was under such duress. He would, he would curl up in a fetal position because he was so depressed. He was emotionally broken. But the moment he began to forgive her, he said this weight came off of him. And he was free. And this is the ironic thing. If you go on YouTube, don't do it right now. There was a special with Larry King. Remember Larry King, the guy with the suspenders? And they had Roe Messinger, they had Jim Baker, Tammy Baker, and, and the, the four of them sitting together, which is bizarre. And they says, I honestly can tell you, I have forgiven Tammy because I can't blame her for doing what she did because I was going to be in prison for 45 years. And I betrayed her trust. And my friend, you know, and he forgave her. And you could just tell. I mean, Larry King was like, you know, he's, of course, Larry King is always that way. But anyhow, he, he was totally blown away. And, and I was blown away watching it. And whether you like those people or not, I, I, that's beside the point. But the truth of the matter is he, he forgave. And she forgave. And they were free. Listen, you can be the same way. You don't have to live with this guilt and condemnation. You don't have to live with this curse of sin. But if you don't forgive, God won't forgive you. The question is, what are you going to do? Well, how do I forgive? I keep saying I'm going to end and I don't. But I need to end one more time. This is an illustration I've used a number of times. It's so important. Remember, forgiveness is not a feeling. It is a decision. If I break my arm and I go to the doctor and the doctor says, I'm going to have to put your arm in a cast so we can heal. So what do I do? I have to submit myself to the doctor's care. I have to submit myself to a cast. I have to submit myself not to use my right arm for eight weeks, whatever it is. Right? If I do that, I can break, hurt my arm. So that's why they put a cast on, so you don't move it. When you forgive somebody, it's an act of the will. Lord, I forgive this person. I have no emotion to it, but I forgive them. And you, you may be screaming inside, no, I can't forgive them. No, Lord, in the mighty name of Jesus, I forgive this person. What you're doing is you're putting emotions in a cast. And every time you want to, the next day, you're like, oh, I'm through, I'm through that now. You come back to church, you see that, oh, and you want to do it again. I forgive that person. You submit your emotions to the decision of forgiveness with the grace and power of God Almighty. And eventually, your emotions will heal. You'll take off the cast. You might need some physical therapy occupational therapy for a while but eventually you'll look at your arm and it'll be stronger you go you know what I have a scar here there's no more pain associated with it but I am free my friends forgiveness is a decision some of you have not forgiven yourself because you had an abortion some of you not forgiven yourself because you've cheated on your spouse and you feel like you can never make it right again some of you are so angry at your spouse that you never forgive them again. I have news for those that you won't forgive. I had a, we had a person that we knew of. Again, not in this church, okay? And they were so distraught that their wife cheated on him. He was distraught. He hated the fact. He could not stand her. Every time we talked about it, he go, oh, she was a cheat. He married another woman. And guess what he ended up doing? He cheated on his new wife. Why? Partially, and he recognized it later on because he did not forgive his ex-wife. My friends, forgiveness is absolutely essential to your spiritual health, as essential as eating, breathing, and sleeping. If you do not forgive, God won't forgive you. The consequences are dire. Let's choose today to obey his word and forgive ourselves, each other, and live in the freedom that God has for us. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, I, I want to thank you, Lord. This is a hard message to preach, God, because it's, it's hard. Lord, I, I, I stand up here not, not knowing what people are going through right now, but I thank you your word is true, Lord. And, and Lord, we are not designed to hold on forgiveness. And so, Lord, we choose in obedience to your word to forgive. I'm going to pray for you right now. Lord, I just pray right now that you would reveal to our hearts right now the person or the people or perhaps ourselves that we have not forgiven right now I want you to think of those people right now 
and say, Lord Jesus, I forgive this person or persons. I ask for your strength to maintain this decision, which is an act of my will, married to your power. I, I release this person in Jesus' name. I forgive the person that abused me. I forgive my parent. I forgive my ex-spouse. I forgive that uncle or aunt. I forgive that pastor. I forgive that teacher. In Jesus' name, Lord, I hand them over to you. You deal with them. I release myself from them. In Jesus' name, I forgive them. And Lord, every day this comes back to me, I will, by your grace, forgive them and continue to give it to you. Lord, would you heal my emotions? Lord, would you heal this wound? I will trust you. I will follow your word above my thoughts and above my feelings because I know what I heard today is from your word and is true. I forgive. I forgive myself for making these horrible mistakes. Thank you that you forgive me. Thank you, it says in the scripture, that if I confess my sin, you're faithful and just to forgive me of my sins. I confess my sins right now. Wash me and cleanse me in Jesus' name. Now I want to pray for some of you that never gave your life to Christ. You know what I'm saying today. Today's a new day. All you have to do is give your life to Jesus. Say, Lord, I no longer have claim on my life. I give my life to you. If you'll pray this prayer from your heart and mean it, today's a new day. You want to follow me in your heart. Lord Jesus, I believe you are the Son of God. I thank you for dying on the cross for my sins. I ask you to forgive me of all of my sins, both known and unknown. And I choose to follow you all the days of my life. I declare that you are the boss. You are the, you're the master of my life. I am no longer in charge. You are in charge. Give me the strength to walk the path that you have for me today. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's take communion. Jesus says, this is my body which has been broken for you. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ and you've given your life to Christ and you're forgiving somebody right now, I encourage you to take this. If not, don't take it. This is my body which is broken for you. All of you take, eat. After they supped, Jesus took the wine and said, this is the new covenant. What washes away our sin? What makes us cleanse? It's by the blood of Jesus, not by the sweat of our brow, but by the sweat of his brow and by the blood on the cross and the nails in his hand. He paid for all of our sin wholly, completely, that you and I are white before him, clean. Take, drink. I'm going to ask the prayer team to make their way up. If you need prayer for healing or prayer for a job or a situation at home, perhaps you need someone to walk through what we just did. Maybe you gave your life to Christ today for the first time. Would you come up and share it with somebody? Listen, we're all this together. I'm going to have Esteban lead us in one closing song. As we do that, prayer team, make your way up. Thank you.